I don't know if you know the name Frank Abagnale. I, I didn't know this name until uh, a few years back. A movie by the name of Catch Me If You Can uh, came out in the theaters. And it's a really amazing story uh, when you think of, of, of who this guy was. His story is, is well known because of this movie that will star uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. And it was about uh, this guy who, uh, who was basically living a, a double life or actually living multiple lives. Uh, for, if, you, if you don't know about Agnale, he was a notorious con artist who successfully posed as an airline pilot, a teacher, a doctor, and a lawyer in the late 1960s. He started duping the airlines when he was 16 years old and managed to fly more than a million miles for free over the, over the course of a couple of years. It talks about that he actually took uh, things from toys and fixed them to his, uh, to his hat and his clothes to make him look like a pilot. And he convinced people that he was a pilot and he co-piloted uh, just, just miles and miles and miles of, of airtime. After forging a degree from Columbia <laughs> University, he taught a course in sociology at Brigham Young University. From there, he went to Georgia where he posed as chief resident pediatrician of a hospital. And at, at 19, he forged a degree from Harvard, and after managing to pass the Louisiana bar exam, he worked at a law firm for eight months. He was finally caught in France at the age of 22 for forging checks. And it kind of blows my mind, that's what caught him, forging checks. You know, after doing all this other stuff, I mean, I, I don't know how he pulled these things off, but he was living, um, he was living a double life, and the, the ironic thing is he now, serving time, he now uh, teaches consumers how to avoid, he writes books teaching consumers how to avoid uh, being the victims of identity fraud, which is just really ironic. But the idea of him living these double lives and, and him being someone who he really isn't, you know, I think a lot of times in life, we kind of do the same thing. We kind of live a double life. And that's what we're talking about today as how we live now that we've come through the sea, how God has brought us through this journey. What do we do with life? How do we live? And for a lot of people, I think they kind of see life in two different ways. That on one side, they sort of see life, you know, everything about life. And then on the other side, there is life in God or life as a Christian. You know, life is, is all that, all the things of Friends and a career and hobbies and family and school and sports and clubs and groups and, and all these things. And then sort of over here we have life with God. And that's rules and traditions and good times of miracles and him working in our lives. And then back over at life we have sort of the trials of life and hard times and the excitements and the good times and the events. And then life with God, well, we kind of see as when we need him and when it's time for us to spend time with God and when we want him to interact in our lives. Well, the goal for us this morning is when we walk out of here, for us to see life in a different way. It's not two different realms. It's not two different worlds. It's not two different personalities. But for us to look at life in God, living for God, maybe in a new way. You see, for the Israelites, God's people, they had been on this journey. And that journey, like we said, is like the same journey that we go through as people. God had brought them, uh, starting as, you know, as Moses and, and being uh, slaves and, and bringing them out of that to freedom and not really knowing God when they were in slavery. In fact, more than likely, some of them may have even uh, worshipped other gods or kind of uh, brought in some of other type of worships into their worship of Yahweh God. But, but the bottom line is they didn't really know who God was. And so God brings them from being an unknown God and they're stuck in slavery and bringing them out of slavery and bringing them to this place. And now they're in this place where they're ready to live for God and they want to, they want to be God's people. And, and, and probably a lot of times we see things um, in the same way. You know, if, if God brings us through these hard times, and it's been so great. I've had folks share with me over the past few weeks, man, it's so great to hear this. That's just right where I am. And this is what's going on in my life. And this is what's happening. And it's great to hear how God is able to take the book of Exodus and bring it to life in, 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 in our lives and see these things. And we kind of go through life like the, like the Israelites. And we get to this point where now it's sort of, well, now we have the rest of our life. What do we do with this? But a lot of times I think we miss how God wants us to live. I think we miss something about what God has called us to when it comes to life. Again, I think we sort of have this idea that there is life, and then there is life in God and life as a Christian. And we can somehow bounce between the two of them and go back and forth. But I believe if we would catch two things that I want, to, I want to discuss today from the scriptures, two things about life in God, I think it would change the way we live our lives for God. And I really believe that it changed the way that the Israelites lived for God. And these two things that we're going to spend our time studying is God's presence 
and God's calling. God's presence and God's calling. And, and you, might, you might think about that. Well, well, that's it? God's presence and God's calling? I mean, that, that's all there is to helping us kind of understand what God's, God wants for our life? And, and, and yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think sometimes we feel like we have to make life in God so complicated and so full of stuff and doing, it's, it's doing this and doing that and doing all these things, and we kind of miss the life that God has called us to. But I really believe God has called us just to understand his presence and his calling. And today we're going to kind of really dive into these two things and see how they affected the Israelites and see how it could affect our lives as we live for him. You know, these things that we do for God are so important. You know, sometimes we think that life in God means, well, I've got to study my Bible. I've got to get up early in the morning when no one else is up. And I've got to be reading and reading and reading and reading. And if I can just, you know, dump more of the Bible into my life, or if I could just be a good person, if I can just avoid doing bad things, then that's what God wants for me. He just wants me to be a good person. You know, or if I could just figure out a way to make my kids good or my family good, or if I can just do enough good things for other people or, or, or do all these things. You know, while all these are so great and they aid us in our development and our relationship with God, they are not the point. And they can even become our new God, our new, uh, our new goal of trying to strive for different standards. So today we're going to look at these two things of God's presence and God's calling in our life. So let's look at the very first part of that, God's presence. You know, God has always been present in life. And a lot of times we, we forget about it. And it, it's kind of weird that we would forget about a God who is, he, who is so imminent, who is so here, we seem to forget about him sometimes. But he is here. I mean, even all the way back to the very beginning. I love to read in the very part, first part of Genesis where it says that God was walking in the cool of the day. And that's, that just blows my mind to think of God walking around in the garden there with these people. Now, it didn't end so well after that because God discovered they had sinned, but to know that he, that, that was a, probably a regular thing for him to do is amazing. God wanted to be present. But then also we see throughout the Old Testament, if you keep on going, we see God wanting to speak to his people. And he used prophets, he used these different means to speak to God's people and to share uh, what, what his, his message was to them and his way for living. Even into the New Testament, we see God putting on flesh and coming to the earth in the form of his son because Jesus coming to the, to the world in human form. And then even after he left... God still wants to be present. He sends his spirit. He gives us his word to be his presence, to be his guidance for us here today. God is an imminent God. God is here. He wants to be present. Well, for the Israelites, we see that God showed up in two unique ways now in their, in their lives. The first way was the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is just basically a mobile temple. In fact, um, we find in, in Exodus 25, in verse 8, it says, then, uh, then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And in fact, if you were to read the next several chapters, you would see all the specifics about how God wanted this tabernacle to be made. And a lot of it had some very deep significance to it. You know, we may read that and think, oh, well, that's nice that he wanted this there and he wanted these things in that place. But they had purpose. They had meaning. Not only meaning for these people right then, but kind of a, a, a pointing meaning of a foreshadowing of what was to come in Jesus. And all of this was so great that, you know, God said, I want this to be in the middle of the camp. I want this to be my pres my, the place where my presence will be. Uh, and this is, how, this is where God would come and he would meet uh, with the priests and God would come and he would be present in the midst of the camp. But not only that, God also showed up in a cloud and in fire to lead them. Whenever God said, all right, it's time to get up and go, he would lead them in this way. We find this in Exodus chapter 40, verse 36. And all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was, was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. Could you imagine seeing that? You know, knowing that God's presence is there, not even just a stationary presence, when that cloud lifted up, when that cloud started to move, that was your sign. All right, it's time to move. Because I know sometimes people have said to me, Joe, I don't know how I'm supposed to live, where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to do. This was a very obvious thing. God was saying, it's time to move. To see this cloud lift up and to move and to go. I mean, it was the original GPS, I guess you could say, for the Israelites. It was, you know, your, your turn is ahead and 300 feet, turn left or whatever. This is what God was doing for these people to show them exactly where they were going to go. The point of us, I mean, pointing this out is, is for us to understand that God is here. 
It, so easily it's for us, for us to think in our minds that God is distant. God is off somewhere else. God is doing something else. I mentioned this a few weeks back. That some people see God as what you could call a cosmic clockmaker. This idea that God formed the world so, so skillfully like a clockmaker would do and put all the pieces in the right spot and get everything looking just the way he wanted it. And then he sort of closes it up, swings the pendulum and steps away and says, okay, that's, all, that's good to go. It'll do its thing. That's not how God works. God didn't just set the world on its axis and spin it and walk away and say, they'll figure it out. No, God is here. God is present. The same God in the Old Testament that we read about is present today in this room. Amen. And we have so often forgot about, forgotten about that. And the amazing thing is that we are told in the book of Exodus that he might even be present in our lives in a greater way than what these people we've read about here. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 39 it says all these were commended for their, commended for their faith. And let me kind of tell you who all these were. All these, if you read in the, in the previous part of this chapter, is kind of the heroes of our faith. The people who did so many things and trusted God in so many great ways. The, the famous names that we, would, that we all recognize. And that's a great uh, uh, chapter to read through and study. But it says all these were committed for, commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. Now, some may say that this is heaven that's being talked about. Or some may say this is God's Holy Spirit coming and living not around us, but living in us. But either way, the fact is, God is here in a very different way, in a very special way in our lives. And the great promise that we have as Christians is that when we give our lives to the Lord, when we have our sins washed away, He doesn't just stand at a distance and say, good job, I'm proud of you. No, He comes and lives in us. In Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of, the, of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not only that, we even read of Jesus talking with his disciples before he's about to leave this earth. And, and he, says, he says, you know, I, I've got to leave. In fact, it would be better for me to leave. In, in John 16, 7, but very truly I tell you, it is, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I mean, the, the apostles had the privilege of God in flesh walking alongside him. And I know so often we say that. Oh, if God would just show up right here and tell me what I should do or where I should go or how I should live. If God was just right here and could make it very plain. But the thing is, Jesus himself says, it's better for me to go so that the advocate can come. God's spirit can come. We are blessed in an awesome way to know that when God has sent his presence, it's not a distant present. It is a present that is right here here with us. God is present. Are you getting that? Have I said it enough? God is here. The other thing we need to understand about life in God is God's calling. And again, this is not anything that's rocket science. It's not anything that's big and hard for us to kind of reach out and grab a hold of and understand. It's very simple. This is how God wants us to live. And some people think it's all about a list of do's and don'ts. Some people think it's all about having my checklist or, checklist or having enough good stuff in life to do. Uh, in fact, there are many religions in this world today that will tell you as long as you can get enough good stuff to outweigh your bad stuff, okay, then you'll be good to go. But that's not how God works. You see, God says that, that, that there's a different kind of standard. There's a different kind of law. Yes, God gives us laws and he gives us standards. In fact, when God gave these Ten Commandments to the Israelites... Some look at those and say, well, this is, this is the exact standard i got to live, live by. If I, if I waver off any of these, well, then I'm doomed forever. And we've got to understand the purpose of God's laws. You see, God was taking these people who were in slavery and brought them to freedom. And imagine a, a group of people who were, who were taken from one place of having very strict rules, very strict laws, very strict standards of how they could live, where they could go, what they could do, how they're supposed to spend their time, to freedom. Could you imagine the, the, just the anarchy that would happen and just the craziness that would take place for people to go from complete control to freedom? And God is saying, I've got to bring order to this. You see, God was not saying, great, I've got these people out here now. I can put my thumb on them. I can make them do the, the little nitpicky things here and there, and I can be real stingy about, the, about the, the ways that they live. No, God was saying, I've got to bring order to these people. You see, God is a God of order and of purpose. And that's what he was doing here with these laws. God has laws for our lives. God has ways for us to live. But the point of those laws is not for us to get hung up on just doing and doing and doing. 
So often we miss the point. In fact, we see that throughout the Old Testament, as, as uh, different groups of people begin to kind of understand God's laws and try to live by God's laws, eventually uh, many different religious sects begin to show up to where that they would take these laws and try to make even more laws in addition to God's laws. It's almost like you know they had God's laws, then they had laws about God's laws, and then they had laws about laws about God's laws. And it became dizzying, and it became overwhelming. And Jesus even talked about how, he said, you know, after a while, you, you heap more burdens on the people's backs, but you do nothing to help them with that. And throughout the centuries, we, people took these laws, and they missed the fact of what God was trying to accomplish with them. And it took, finally, Jesus coming and saying, here's the point, people. This is what it's all about. And so someone tries to trick Jesus. We all know about this part in the Gospel of Matthew. Someone tries to trick Jesus by asking him, what's the most important law then? And we find in Matthew 22, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And this is key. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Amen. That is so huge for us to understand that everything God was telling the Israelites, everything about those laws that God was trying to lay out, was this right here, to love God and love people. And we look at this and we say, it's really that simple? This is really what God has called us to? You mean he's not called me to a long checklist? He's not called me to a long list of, of do's and don'ts? Well, yeah, he has called you to those things. Those are the things that kind of give us guardrails in life. But the real point of life is to simply love God and love people. So let's kind of draw these things together. You know, we take these, these things and, and we understand this idea about God's presence and God's calling. You know, what do we do with these things? What do we do with these things in our lives and how can we really live these things out? Well, the first thing we've got to do is that we've got to understand that God wants to be present in your life. God wants to be present in your life. And again, I think sometimes we think about this in, 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 in terms of other people. We think, oh yeah, you know, God wants to be doing this and that in their life. God wants to come near and be doing this in, in our community. But we forget that God wants to be present in our life today. God doesn't want to just be another facet of your life. God doesn't want to just sit on your bookshelf when you get home from church until it's next Sunday. God wants to be a part of your life. When Jesus quoted that, that Deuteronomy passage of loving God with all your, your heart, and soul, mind, and strength, that means everything about who you are. And so often we kind of intimidated about these things and we think it's going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be so much harder to have God in our life. Well, if God's in my life, that means, you know, he's going to see what I'm doing. He's going to know where I've been. He's going to know what I've been a part of. Well, he already knows those things. Why not have him along for the ride and have, have him guide you through these things? It's kind of like, you know, when the boss maybe invites you over to his home. Uh, and, you know, he's like, bring your family on over to my house. We're going to have a cookout. And you kind of get intimidated and you think, well, I don't want to go to my boss's place. I don't want him to see what I'm really like. I don't want him to, to see what my kids are really like. I don't want him to know who I really am. And we get intimidated. And we think about that with God. And we think, I don't know if I want God in my life personally. He's going to see who I really am. He's going to see all my shortcomings and all my, and all my faults. And it gets kind of overwhelming. It's you know, kind of a similar situation is when people find out I'm a minister. It's like the whole conversation changes instantly. You know, <laughs> It goes from a very open and easy conversation so they find out I'm a preacher and it's like whoa you know all the they get very proper and they button up their collar and they start saying nice thing and their language cleans up real quickly and they you know praise the Lord comes out a whole lot more and it's like what in the world I, and, and it almost drives me nuts in fact a lot of times I avoid telling people I'm a minister not because I'm embarrassed of what I do I love what I do because I, I recognize that sometimes when we know that that someone is in our presence we try and be different. And that's not what it's about with God being in our presence. It's not about us trying to pretend that we're something that we're not. God wants us to know that he is here. And what a blessing that should be. You know, when we talk about in Acts 2 through 8, when Peter says that if we would have our sins washed away, if we would turn our lives to God, we could have God's presence come and be close to us. You know, for the Israelites, that tabernacle was as close as it was going to get. And the sad thing was is that not all of them could even come face to face with God. There were two rooms in that, in that mobile sanctuary. The outer room uh, was the holy place, and then the inner room was the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And only one person could go in there once a year. Only the high priest could go behind that, that, that double curtain that hung there. It separated God's presence from his people. 
But the awesome thing we find in Matthew 27, this is when Jesus was crucified on the cross. It says, and when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Folks, you see at that point, when that, cor- when that curtain was torn, God was saying, I have come near And I have come because I want to be present in your life and I want to be near you. And it's awesome that that curtain, that curtain was not torn by any man. It was too thick and it was torn from the top, not the bottom. It was torn from the top down. God showing, I have come near. You see, God wants to be present in our lives. But the second thing we have to understand about all this is that we have to live life on God's terms. We have to live life on God's terms. And this is sort of the sticking point for a lot of people. You know, this is the kind of the idea that we love the idea that God is here. We love the idea that God is present. We love the idea that God wants to be active in our lives. But we don't necessarily like the idea that God wants us to live on his terms. You know, we love to kind of do things our way, especially in our culture. Our culture is all about have it your way. You know, we see restaurants where they want to customize everything your way. You know, our vehicles can be customized right down to the, you know, to the very, the very smallest minute detail. We talk about the things that we do, the, the, the way that we live, the, the, the clothes we wear. Everything about our lives can be tailored perfectly to what we want. And that's kind of how we want our relationship with God to be, too. You know, I love the idea that God sent his son to die for my sins. I mean, we all love that, to have our sins forgiven. But maybe we don't love the idea that he wants to be in charge of my life too. That he's called me to come and die. I mean, Jesus said to his disciples, unless you lose your life, you'll never find it. Unless you're willing to pick up a cross with me and go to the cross and die, you will never find life. And we act as if we know the best way to live. And we act as if, well, I can figure it out on my own. I mean, I know myself. I know what life is about. But shouldn't we go to the one who designed the life? Now, you've got to excuse kind of the crude illustration, but it makes me think of my son and his Legos. He loves Legos. My son loves, loves to play with Legos, and I've got to tell you, I hate Legos now because my son loves them so much. And he, he loves to, to put them together. Actually, he loves to get them so I can put them together, and he can then take them apart and have me put them back together again. And, and he, he'll say things like, oh, I, he found this Lego helicopter he wanted for Christmas, and I was telling Beth, I was like, let's just buy him a helicopter because we don't have to put that together, okay? You know? But he wants these things, and, and of course, he wants me to put them together right away. And there's just billions of pieces, and I look at them, and I think, what in the world? And, and we, I have, we have a, a folder full of Lego instructions. It's kind of sad, but these things are impossible to put together without these instructions because they go, they go together in a very specific way if you want this outcome. And so I, you know, I put these things together, and it takes forever. And, and sometimes I like to think that maybe I could try and figure it out on my own, just look at the box so I can see the picture. Oh, yeah, I can put that together. But there's no way. And like I said, that's a crude example of of life, but that's kind of how it is. We look at life and we say, I can figure this out. I know how to live. I know what's going to be. And and we look at the life that we come up with on our own. And, man, it is a poor comparison to life in God. I mean, shouldn't we go to the one who created life? Shouldn't we go to the one who designed life, who made us? In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord. With all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. You know, and while this might go against everything in us and while this might go against our culture, you know, we want it our way. But if we would live God's way and if we would live and love the way that he wants us to live and love, we would enjoy life a whole lot more. I really believe that. We would not have to be banging our heads against the wall and saying, why isn't this working out? Why isn't this happening? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that life will then be perfect and there'll be no troubles along the way. But God will be able to guide us through those troubles when we are trusting in him and we are looking to the designer of life and allowing him to be the one to guide us. And so we've come to the end of this series. We've come to the end of this Story, But the really, like I said before, this isn't the end of the story. This is only the end of our study of this because the story of the Israelites continues on. They would go into the wilderness and they would, they would kind of wander. God would guide them through the, the wilderness for generations and generations before finally reaching the promised land. And we're in the same way. You know, so often we find ourselves struggling through this wilderness, trying to figure out where to go and how to live. But the great thing is God calls us back to two basic things over and over again. His presence and his calling in his life, or his calling on our life. 
If we would just simply try to wrap our brains around the fact that God wants to be close, God wants to be personal, God wants to be in our lives. And if we could wrap our brains around the fact that God has called us to two great things, to love him and to love others, and I think we would find the life that God has called us to. I often wonder how much wandering the Israelites really would have had to have done if they would have quickly wrapped their brains more around this, these concepts. And perhaps we would do the same thing too. We would do a whole lot less wandering in life if we would simply just find the truth about God's presence and his calling on our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful uh, for your presence in our life, God, that you are a close God that you're a God that wants to be here right with us, to know us personally, to lead us, to guide us. But God, you've also called us to two what seem like small things but are great callings in our lives, to love people and to love you. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to complicate things, not to complicate life in you with so much stuff and feel like there's so much to it, but God, to simply find the true and full life that you've called us to, of loving you and loving people. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he came to this earth. Thank you that he made it possible, that, that, that curtain torn in two, to move that, to move that obstacle out of the way that now we can come individually to you in a personal relationship and know you. We thank you for him. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen.